Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Those of you who are regular viewers know that I do a lot of response videos, but I'm going to transition into more teaching material over the next few months and only focus on response videos when I feel it's absolutely necessary. One thing I've always wanted to address on this channel is responding to secularism, which is defined as indifference to or rejection of religion. As our culture grows increasingly secular, the need arises to become more familiar with the worldview of atheists and agnostics and know how to respond to their objections. Today I'm going to start a series on creationism, and I'm going to start it off by discussing cosmology, the study of the origin and development of the cosmos or universe. This won't be an exhaustive discussion on the subject, of course, but when we're done, you should be informed enough to discuss this topic with the average science nerd. The current view in the world of science is that the universe began 13.8 billion years ago in what is now referred to as the Big Bang Theory. So let me give you some background on how this theory came about. For a couple of centuries, scientists believed that the universe has always existed and had no beginning. This came to be known as the steady state theory. Some believed that our galaxy, the Milky Way, was the whole universe. But others believed that there were other galaxies beyond ours. Then in 1924, an astronomer named Edwin Hubble, the man they named the Space Telescope after, made a discovery at the Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California. He looked through what was at that time the largest telescope in the world and discovered that most of the stars that we see in the night sky were in fact galaxies. This was an amazing discovery that the universe is much bigger than anybody had previously imagined and it confirmed that there are in fact thousands of galaxies similar to ours. Through advancements in technology, our understanding of the universe has increased and today, it's estimated that there are 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. But Hubble soon made another discovery. These galaxies were moving away from us and away from each other. He did that by observing what is referred to as red shift. Red shift is the optical equivalent of the Doppler effect that you hear when an emergency vehicle passes you with its siren on or a race car when it runs by you. As it approaches you, the sound waves get shorter and the pitch gets higher. And then as it moves away, the sound waves get longer and the pitch gets lower. Well, the same thing happens with light waves, only you detect it with a color spectrum instead of your ears. So Hubble's discovery proved that the universe is expanding. The implication of this was profound because if it's expanding as you go forward in time, that would mean that it's contracting as you go back in time. And eventually, you would arrive at a point where the universe was just one tiny, dense, hot speck of space-time, matter, and energy that is referred to as the singularity. This is where the Big Bang Theory originated. For some unknown reason, the singularity began expanding until it produced the observable universe that we're told is about 90 billion light years across. That means that if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you 90 billion years to traverse the universe. The implication of the expanding universe was huge because it meant that the universe had a beginning. That wasn't something that the world of science wanted to hear because by that time, science had abandoned the outdated religious view of God creating the universe and held that everything could be explained by purely natural processes in a static universe. Now, in 1931, Albert Einstein visited the Mount Wilson Observatory and met with Dr. Hubble. And although he had previously believed, like most all the other scientists, that the universe had no beginning, he announced that his views had changed on the matter due to Hubble's discovery. This wasn't easy to do because in his 1915 theory on general relativity, his understanding of gravity told him that a static universe would collapse back in on itself. But rather than change his view on the static universe, 
He factored into his equation what he referred to as the cosmological constant that explained why the universe didn't collapse. There was no evidence to support the cosmological constant, but going by the steady state theory, his equation didn't work without it. And he was convinced that his equation was right, so he included it. Well, now he was forced to admit that his first conclusion was right, that the universe isn't steady and its cosmological constant was nothing more than a fudge factor. He called this the biggest blunder of his career. Now here's the philosophical quandary for the atheist, who believes that everything is a result of natural forces. If the universe began with that expansion of the singularity, where did the singularity come from and what caused its expansion? Whatever it was, it had to exist outside of space, time, matter, and energy, and it wasn't bound by the laws that govern our universe. This meets the Judeo-Christian definition of God. So in effect, whether you believe in God or not, you have to have a miracle to get the whole thing started. This is what Aristotle referred to as the unmoved mover or the prime mover. In the world of apologetics, we refer to this as the Kalam cosmological argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. The universe began to exist, and therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. But the world of cosmology is dominated by materialists. Materialism is the view that matter is all that exists, and there is no spirit realm. So naturally, they reject the idea of a prime mover other than natural material causes. So for the past 70 years or so, they've been hard at work trying to explain away the creationist implications of the universe having a beginning. Now, one of the biggest critics of the Big Bang Theory was an English astronomer named Sir Fred Hoyle, who actually coined the term in a derogatory manner. He was an atheist who couldn't stand the idea that the universe had a beginning. He proposed a steady state model that explained how the universe could appear to be expanding and still be eternal. But over time, his theory was rejected by most. So from the 1930s to the 1960s, the world of science came around and accepted the fact that the universe had a beginning, even if they weren't willing to attribute that to a deity. Slowly, the Big Bang Theory emerged as more data on the cosmos was obtained, and the age of the universe continued to increase as further galaxies were observed. Currently, the furthermost galaxy is about 13.3 light years from Earth, and since it's believed that it took about a half a billion years for everything to cool down enough for, to allow for the formation of galaxies, that put the age of the universe at about 13.8 billion years. Our star system, called the solar system, is about 4.6 billion years old, and the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. But for the longest time, Earth was a violent place with rampant lightning and volcanoes. It took about 1 billion years for the Earth to cool down and stabilize enough to make the planet inhabitable. So that's a brief overview of the current theory of cosmology. Now, in the same 1915 theory of general relativity, Einstein proposed what he called the space-time continuum, also referred to as the fabric of space. In proposing this, he was challenging the accepted view on gravity proposed by Sir Isaac Newton. In Newton's theory, gravity is a pulling force toward a mass against a smaller mass. When you jump up, gravity pulls you back down. Einstein said, I don't think this is how it works. I think gravity is a pushing force from the fabric of space against the mass. So the world of science said, that's an interesting hypothesis, Einstein. How are you going to prove it? So Einstein said that they should observe the next solar eclipse to see if the position of the stars shifted, which would indicate that the mass of the sun was curving the fabric of space. So in 1919, they set up a couple of makeshift observatories in Africa and Brazil. And sure enough, there was a detectable shift in the position of the stars, proving Einstein's hypothesis. Since then, the world of physics has operated under a completely different understanding of gravity. When you jump up, the mass of the Earth doesn't pull you down. The fabric of space 
pushes you back against the mass of the earth. Now, the thing I wanted to point out is this. In Job 9, 8, it says that God stretches out the heavens. In Psalm 104, 2, it says that he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. In Isaiah 40, 22, it says he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. What are curtains made of? Fabric. And God stretches out the heavens with the fabric of space. Thousands of years before Einstein came up with the idea, the Bible already told us. Thousands of years before it was discovered that the universe had a beginning, the Bible already told us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. The word universe isn't in the Bible because they didn't have our modern understanding of the cosmos. They just said the heavens and the earth, or the heavens. So essentially, God is saying that the universe had a beginning. Now, I'm not going to get into the young earth versus the old earth debate here. I have my own view on that that I've already shared in another video that I'll link to in the description. The main point that I wanted to make is that people who reject the Bible on the basis of how unscientific it is are often proven wrong. Theories come and go, but the word of the Lord is forever settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 89. Now let's look at something else that's gravity-related. Sir Fred Hoyle, the atheist who rejected the idea that the universe had a beginning, eventually realized that the universe was fine-tuned to such an extent that it was ridiculous to conclude that things turned out the way they did by chance. He said, A common-sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super-intellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. He never embraced religion, though. Instead, he came up with a theory called panspermia, which says that life on Earth couldn't have come about through purely natural processes, as Darwinians insist. It must have been seeded here by other highly intelligent beings. We'll explore this a bit further in a future video on intelligent design. I mentioned earlier that atheists are trying to explain away the creationist implications of the universe having a beginning. Well, they also have to try to explain the fine-tuning, which suggests a designer. Their current theory is that there's more than one universe. In fact, there's probably an infinite number of universes. And in an infinite number of universes, you're certain to have one where everything exists in such a way as to support life. Lucky us. This is called the multiverse theory. There's no way of proving this, of course, because other universes would exist with a different set of laws that aren't detectable in our universe. In the world of science, a theory has to be observable and testable, and a multiverse will never meet that criteria, so it will always remain nothing more than a convenient hypothesis to explain away the idea of a supreme being. So that's a brief overview of the issues regarding the universe and creationism. I'll leave you a few links to check out in the description. In the next video in this series, we'll discuss the origin of life. Thanks for watching, and be blessed.